Hello, welcome to this video, Lecture 5's R Companion. So we're going to look at two-way ANOVA. In fact, we're going to focus on Section 9.3, and specifically Example 9.3. We're going to start with the data in Table 9.5. We're going to find all the summary statistics that are in Table 9.5. We're going to go through the solution, eventually end up with Table 9.6, or technically all the numbers that are in Table 9.6. And then just to put the icing on the cake, we're going to get figure 9.1, or something rather close to figure 9.1. So that's the goal, and probably we should turn to page 484, and then the data table on 485. But first, I'm going to start a new script. We'll go ahead and tile these vertically. Um, thankfully, I have already um, gotten the data in there. I'm sure you can figure out how to do this. I'll make this a little bit wider just so you can see everything. And of course, you know, to pause, you can copy this down in your own R script. So I'm just going to run it. Yeah, don't forget the pause button. It's kind of important. So that information is directly from table 9.5. So this is going to be the numbers in the body. And now we need to calculate some of the uh, summary statistics. And um, we're going to use the aggregate function for most of it. And for the aggregate function, the first parameter is the variable that you're trying to calculate something on. The next is a list of your grouping variables. And then the last thing is the function that you are applying to that uh, numeric variable in the beginning. So running that, I will get the means, the group sample means, for each combination of engine and motor oil. So this 25.86 can be located in the bottom, let's see if I can do the bottom right of the table. Well, not total bottom and total right, that's the grand mean, the y bar dot dot dot. This is the cell means under the gas, mi gas miser. And then the second one is going to be doing this by engine, just looking at the group means for the four-cylinder versus that for the six-cylinder. And those are going to be found in the far right of that table. And then the last aggregate is going to be MPG, the average MPG by oil. So those are going to be the uh, bottom row uh, oil means, y bar dot j. And then, of course, the grand mean is just the mean of the MPG. And that's the absolute bottom right, the Y bar dot dot dot. Uh, it's 23.367 in the book, but it looks like to be 23.36 repeating. So that's how we got those summary statistics, and that's how we replicated everything that's in that table. Um, next, we'll, we'll go ahead and do analysis of variance. It's going to be an interaction model. Uh, AOV is the function again. MPG is the dependent variable. Engine and oil are the independent variables. And since I specified this was going to be an interaction, we're going to use a star to separate them. If we did not want the interaction, if we instead wanted an additive model, we would use a plus sign there. So we'll run that and take a summary of it. And there's some information that we can steal from this. Um, we know that the total sum of squares is just the 37.63 plus, 8.56 plus, 20.33 plus, 26.02. We know that the degrees of freedom for the total is 1 plus 2 plus 2 plus 24. So we know that the mean squared for the total is just going to be the total sum of squares divided by the total degrees of freedom. That information is not giving on, given on ours typical analysis of variance table, though. So let's go ahead and see if we can somehow script it so that we can get the total sum of squares, which is page 485, solution 1A. And eventually we want to end up with 92.574 which really is just the sum of these four numbers, but let's go ahead and script it. 
Now there's different ways that we can do that. We could just calculate in R. This is 37.63 plus 8, 8.56 plus 20.33 plus 26, 26.02. And we'll get that 92.54. That's problematic. We could, of course, um, do the trick from last, or maybe from two lectures ago. Pull directly from the summary table. And then this will be row, the engine sum of squares will be row one, column two. Plus summary of mod one of two comma two plus okay that's a lot of typing we all know that I don't like typing um, one thing that we notice that we're repeating over and over and over again is this summary mod one left bracket left bracket one right bracket right bracket. So instead, we could actually save that as a variable name. And I could actually call that just AOV table. So when I run AOV table, I get the output again. But I can also, wherever I see a summary of mod 1, uh, left bracket, left bracket, 1, right bracket, type in AOV table, uh, 3 comma 2. That's much faster typing, and I still mess things up. That's another way we could do this. And we get the same number, except this time we actually get more decimal places. Um, the last way of doing it, what's going to give us the least amount of typing, is just to realize that we're adding things. So it's going to be a sum of something. What are we adding? We're adding things in the AOV table. And now let's look at what we're adding. Notice that the first index goes from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4. So I can do 1 to 4. And that's a colon. And the second index stays 2. And we get the same thing. So this is going to be total sum of squares. So while I'm at it, I might as well get rid of that long hand and call this section total sum of squares. Uh, 1b is the sum of, squ uh, sum of squared cells. Oh, what is that? The sum of squared cells is just going to be, um, <coughs> sorry, getting my bearings here, 37.63 plus 8.56 plus 20.33. So the sum of squared cells is just the sum of these three, the three things that are not explained by the error. So again, it's rows 1, 2, and 3 of column 2. Sum of squared cells is 66.52267. That was 1b. 1c is the sum of squares within, or the sum of squared errors. We've got that. It's right there. It's at 26.024. That's just AOV table of four comma two. And again I do have to remind you the book calls this SSW, sums the squares within. Now the factorial analysis, which is problem two or part two, actually is just pulling off these numbers. S, I'm, these numbers. SSA is 37.632. SSB, uh, I'm sorry, SSC is just 8.563. SSAC, the interaction is 20.328.
degrees of freedom. SSA's degrees of freedom is A minus 1. We only have two types of engines, four cylinder and six, so two minus one is one. Oil degrees of freedom, or S DFC, is just the number of levels of C. There's three oils, so that's going to be three, minus one, so two. Engine oil is just going to be the product of the engine degrees of freedom and the oil degrees of freedom. And the residuals is everything that's left over. Now it moves on and talks about a sum of squares F test. R does not provide that by itself. So let's go ahead and create a sum of squares cells F test. This is also called a model test, by the way. So the, we need to first calculate the mean squared cells. So I'm going to call this SS cells. I'm going to just name it as a variable. Uh, the mean squared cells is equal to 1 plus 2 plus 2, which is 3, um, which is 5. Or we could make it, uh, we could do it program, uh, not MS, DF, DF cells. We can program it so it's the first three rows, but the first column, which means that the mean squared cells is just equal to the sum of square, squared cells divided by the degrees of freedom cells. And what is mean squared cells? 13.3043. By the way, if you look over at table 9.6, dependent variable, MPG source, the first row is model. That's what we're figuring out here. Degrees of freedom model is DF cells, which was five. Sum of squares, did we actually calculate that, show that yet? Oh, I did the wrong one. Sum of squared cells, there we go. Had me worried for a moment. 66.52, etc. Mean square, 13.30. The F value, whoops, how do we do that? As always, the F value is just the ratio between the mean squared model and the mean squared error. So I guess that means we need to figure out next, SSE, the mean squared error. So DF error, row 4, column 1. So mean squared error is just the sum of squared error divided by the DF error, which is, according to what we calculated here, 1.08. And according to table 9.6 is 1.08. So the F is just the ratio of the MS cells divided by the mean squared error. And what is that test statistic? 12.26978. And now the p-value. p-value is a, a cumulative probability. So the p-value for the f distribution would be pf. And I'm going to change this to f cells. I'll be using f elsewhere. You want to find the uh, cumulative probability at F cells. It is an F distribution, so it requires two degrees of freedom. The first degree of freedom is the DF cells. The second degree of freedom is the DF error. And then we need to specify that we're using the upper tail, or the right-handed probability because the p-value is going to be the probability of, of observing F cells or something more extreme, and that's the stuff that's above it. So there's the p-value, which agrees again with table 9.6. So we've just gone through and uh, recreated the first part of table 9.6. The second part of, ta or the bottom part of table 9.6, well, that's just the AOV table.
Difference is I called it engine, they call it CYL for cylinder. Otherwise, everything's the same, except they don't include the mean squared residuals at the bottom. They do, however, include the mean squared error in the middle section. It's called the root mean squared error, and it's just the square root of 1.084. Square root of 1.084 is that 1.04131327. And finally, let's go to figure 9.1. It's called a profile plot. It's also called an interaction plot. Um, in R, it's called that interaction plot. So the function is interaction.plot. It takes three parameters. So it can have many more, but the three that we're focusing on are we got one categorical variable, a second categorical variable, and then the last thing that it's given is the dependent variable, the measurement variable. So here's what the interaction plot looks like when it's written in this format. Oil type along the bottom. The different lines refer to the different engine type or the different number of cylinders. We see here that there is a large difference in average MPG for gas miser between the six-cylinder and the four-cylinder engines. There doesn't seem to be much difference for the multi-oil between the two engine types. And there may be, there may not be, it's hard to tell, difference between MPGs for the two uh, engine types with standard oil. Look, following the profile here, it looks like the six-cylinder does the best with the multi-oil. And for the dotted line, the four-cylinder seems to do the worst with the standard. So notice that oil is the graft independent, or I'm going to call it the x variable, the graft x variable, and it comes first. So if we were to change the order on this, to where the engine comes first, we'll get another interaction plot, but along the x-axis will just be the engine type. Same information given, just given in a different way. So here it's also easier to see that six-cylinder tends to get worse me uh, average mile per gallon. Doesn't really surprise us. That since this is has a slope of almost zero, that suggests that the multi-oil doesn't have much difference between the four and six cylinder engine in, fact, in terms of miles per gallon. But the others are much steeper effects, much stronger effects. There doesn't seem to be a, a difference between standard and gas miser in terms of six cylinder, but there does seem to be a difference in all three levels in terms of the four cylinder. Notice I prefaced all that with there does seem to be because we don't have confidence intervals here. This point right here where my cursor is pointing, that's the mean MPG for the four cylinder with standard. So if we recall back to when we were running the summary statistics, four cylinder standard, that's 23.52. This number here, or this height, is 23.52. This height is 24 point, it's four cylinder multi, so it's 24.08. And this height is four cylinder gas miser, 25.86. So that's where these uh, elevations come from, from this table. Okay, that was um, example, what example was it, 9.3? That was example 9.3. Let's look at the DFW data, the DF the grades and W withdrawal. So the first thing we got to do is um, load the data. And again, I'll go ahead and make this wide so you can see it all, but I'd pause and then just copy this, uh, type this into my computer. 
the dependent variable is DFW. This is the DFW rate. This is the proportion of students who earn a D, an F, or who withdraw from the course. There's four professors we're paying attention to, Forsberg, Michelson, Cheney, and Winchester. And there's three courses, STAT 2013, STAT 2023, and STAT 2053. And these are ways of getting um, all the data in, in there. So we can just look, control R. So Forsberg in 2013 for this class had a DFW rate of 15. Winchester uh, 20. 53 for this class had a DFW rate of 36%. And note we, that prof is a factor and course is a factor, so we should actually mark them as such. It'll keep errors from or warnings from popping up. And now, just as before, let's go ahead and do the summary statistics and interpret these. So this is the average DFW rate for the STAT 2013 for Professor Cheney, it's 30%. The average for Cheney for STAT 2023 is 28%. And the average for Cheney, for Professor Cheney in STAT 2053 is 29%. So this looks at the individual averages within each combination of course and professor. This next one does it only by course. It allows us to compare the DFW rates across the course, ignoring the professor. So the DFW rate for STAT 2013 is a little over 27%. For STAT 2023, it's a little bit more over 27%. And for STAT 2053, it's a bit less than uh, 27%. And the last one looks at the DFW rate average by professor, ignoring the course. So Cheney's average DFW rate is 29%, Forsberg's is 21.8%, Michelson's is 26.5%, and Winchester's is 31.2%. A lot of variation in terms of the professor, not much variation in terms of the course. And here's the total average or the grand mean DFW rate in the data set, it's 27.125. So of the courses, 2013 and 2023 have a higher than average, and 2053 have a, has a lower than average. Um, Cheney and Michelson have lower than, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. Cheney and Winchester have higher than average. Michelson and Forsberg have lower than average. And we could also look at the, sorry, this table. Cheney in 2013, Cheney in 2023, Cheney in 2053 have higher Forsberg in 2053 has higher than average, Michelson, etc. So these are the means. Let's go ahead and model this now. It's an interaction model. So it's dependent variable and, and the two independent variables. Since this is an interaction model, we're going to separate those with a times or an asterisk. And we'll do mod two or a summary of that to get the abbreviated analysis of variance table. Notice here that course colon prof, that's the interaction between course and professor. Its p-value is less than alpha. And therefore, there is a significant interaction effect between course and professor on the DFW rate. We could, of course, do the model analysis just as we did above. And you'll notice that this script was more or less just copied and pasted. We uh, created the analysis variance to the AOV table to save some typing. We calculated the sum of squared cells, the degrees of freedom cells, and the MS cells. We did the thing, same thing with the um, the errors, the degrees of freedom error and the mean squared error. Then the F statistic is mean squared cells and MS divided by the mean squared error. And then we calculate the, the, the p-value. 
which is PF and then F cells, etc. So the p-value corresponding to the cell analysis or to the model analysis gives a p-value of just under 0.05. That suggests that there's not really much going on here. Um, could be just as a, 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 an effect of a small sample size. We don't have that much data here. Or it could be that there really is no difference amongst the four professors in the three classes and there's not much of an interaction. But we do have some evidence of an interaction. We have some evidence of something happening. And if we look at it, we can actually create those plots and get better feel for it. So this first plot goes across the pr four professors and shows that the courses, the DFW for each of the courses. So if you look here for Cheney, the three course, the, the DFW rates for the three courses are pretty close together. So it doesn't look like the course has much effect on Cheney's DFW rate. Uh, for Forsberg, that's not the case. For Forsberg, you got these two DFW rates really low, and that's for the stat 2013 and 2023. And then you got this one really high, comparatively speaking, stat 2053. For Michelson, just the opposite. The 2013-2023 tend to be high, and the 2053 seems to be low. And Winchester seems to mirror Michelson's pattern, but Winchester has a higher average DFW rate than Michelson does in each of the three courses. So if you have to use all four of these professors and you want to minimize the DFW rate, then you're going to give Michelson the 2053, and you're going to want to keep Forsberg away from 2053. And you're probably wanna, gonna wanna get Winchester away from the 2013, 2023. So maybe we'll give Michelson and Winchester the 2053 classes. Forsberg gets, an, uh, gets anything but the 2053 classes. But, and Cheney, it really doesn't matter what you give him. But then on the other hand, if you want to maximize the DFW rate, you'll want to give Forsberg the 2053s. And Michelson and Winchester, you want to give the 2013, 2023s. It all depends on what you want out of this DFW rate. And that's kind of, we're not sure what we want out of the DFW rate. Anyway, that's the end of this lecture. This is lecture five, looking at two-way analysis of variance. I'm showing you how to do a lot of what we did on the board, or I think all of what we did on the board. Um, you may want to go back through the board and see, let's see, I want to go to the summary of mod two. No, I don't want to go to the summary of mod two. Anyway, I guess I'm gonna stop talking now because I'm gonna start rambling, but this is the end of uh, lecture five's Our Companion. So hopefully this was helpful. You might want to look over this a couple of times. I hope that at this point you see this, some of the same things over and over and over and over again, such as the aggregate function to help with the summary statistics, such as how you do the modeling, uh, such as some of the ways of getting data into R. Um, at this point, uh, saving a summary as a variable, and this AOV table is a variable, um, that is new. But since you now realize AOV, is a, AOV table is a variable, you know how to access the parts of the variable. And it should become easier as you go through and use R more and more. It should become easier to figure out how to do things and sometimes how to do things a little bit faster. So take care of yourself. I enjoyed this. Hope you did too. Bye.